So let's talk about what if Thor were an only child. The seventh episode of Marvel's What If. And the premise is that the Nexus event that changes this timeline is that rather than returning, or rather than keeping Luffy and raising him as his own son, Odin gives him back to uh, Luffy of Jotunheim. And as a result of not growing up with a brother, Thor becomes a spoiled, rotten, preening party boy bitch. This episode is insufferable. Top to bottom, just a complete shit show to sit through. I did not like this episode at all. Um, This is probably going to be a pretty short review because I don't have a ton to say that isn't the same stuff over and over or isn't just, I don't like this, I don't like this. Um, So yeah, Thor is just this party prince and... It's just, oh boy, it's kind of embarrassing and I don't like what has been done with any of these characters. Like everybody's just become a bunch of like frat bro party people. Um, Thor is the absolute worst. Uh, Loki shows up as a frost giant and he is just as bad and they do a little... Oh, brother, brother, brothers forever, brother thing that's really painful. Uh, and like makes snide commentary on on things when they start heating up. Uh, Thor's major like one liners are all really ineffectual, like digs, like sophomoric bullshit. Uh, his big put down of Captain Marvel, who is the only bearable character in this entire episode, uh, is that she, they have a word for women like her on Asgard. And you're like, Oh, this is going to be the bait and switch. Cause you expect he's going to say something like bitch. And instead he says party pooper. <sighs> um, There's a lot of cameos in this episode. Um, Basically, the the majority of all named, you know, outer space characters in the MCU show up here as as little one note um, side characters. Uh, There's some scrolls that show up and party. Scourge shows up. Uh, Thor shows up with Lady Sif and the Warriors 3. Loki, like I said, uh, the Grandmaster, who also DJs. I can't decide whether I like the part where he stops the music and goes, release the foam, or or not. And the only reason I'm not sure is because the two times I've watched this episode, I've been so tired of the episode already. And this is like a couple minutes in. This really is not all that far into the episode. Um... Howard the Duck shows up and he's actually pretty bearable. Um, He's only there for a couple quick bits and it's mostly little quick jokes, but they're decent jokes. And Seth Green is actually like doing a good job with the voice, probably because he's got decades of experience as a voice actor now. Um, Most of the Guardians of the Galaxy are there, whether they're part of a team or they just happen to all be there is unclear. Rocket, Drax, uh, Nebula, Yondu, uh, they're all there. Valkyrie is there. Uh, at least it looks like Valkyrie. Um, Korg is there as well. The golden perfect people from from uh, Guardians Volume 2 are there. Uh, Mantis is there as well. Surtur. Surtur is there. And they got Clancy Brown for it. Which, like, I mean, voice acting is, like, his number one thing. Uh, and it was a really weird, goofy take on Surtur. It sounded it like, I don't know. In my head, I'm like, I bet that's Clancy Brown. Because this could, I could just as easily see this coming out of, um, out of Mr. Krabs' mouth. Instead, he flirts with 
uh, the Statue of Liberty and accidentally cuts her raised arm off and then later on solders it back on or welds it back on. I think technically she, it would be soldering just because it's all like, I guess welding is also heat based. I don't know. No, well, whatever. It doesn't matter. None of this matters. Ah, um, uh, boy. Uh, Jane is awful in this episode. She starts out being by, by being, it's the same as, it's the same as the Thor movie. She starts out relatively fine and then quickly devolves. She even like holds her ground when, you know, she's got a, like an iPad or some, some kind of tablet and Thor takes and like, you must be some kind of genius to have made this, this light box. She's like, excuse me, I'm a PhD with multiple, with multiple de- like degrees and da da da. And like in a matter of like seconds beyond that, she's swooning over him. The two of them go out and get matching tattoos. She's got one that has the hammer and it says magic. And he's got one that's got um, a micro, like a microscope and it says science. This is what we're dealing with in this episode. Um, Dr. Selvig had the good sense to not exist in this episode, minus being on the other end of a phone call and inaudible. Uh, Props to Stellan Skarsgård or whoever his replacement voice actor for the episode would have been on not needing to be involved in this shit. Um, Darcy is also here. She's okay. Uh, She's kind of a little much but she also was like that in Thor one and most of her stuff is fine. There's a couple jokes that are like, okay, we're going a little bit, a little bit too far with this one. Let's, let's rein it in a bit. And captain Marvel even says you're up here at like an eight. I need you to, I need you to bring that down to like a four. Um, they go and do a Stonehenge bit. Okay. One good thing they did. I thought this was cute was that when Thor and Captain Marvel fight, she shows up and she's basically like the cop of the scenario. Like, all right, party's over. Everyone clear out, clean up. Uh, She gets knocked out of Las Vegas. No, this is is, uh, later on in Paris. She gets knocked from Paris to the UK, specifically to the site of Stonehenge. Because you gotta, if you're gonna do a thing in the UK, you gotta do a Stonehenge. Uh, I have to, I have to wonder for for fans of ours out in the UK or Europe in general, uh, does it feel exhausting how often Stonehenge seems to come up whenever something that doesn't normally take place in the UK suddenly takes place in the UK? I mean, fuck, even Doctor Who did it, and I, I they took their time getting there. Took him about, uh, what, 48 years, give or take, to, to do a Stonehenge thing? The Underhenge. Uh, but so she shows up and, like, slams into it and has to, oh, fix it. And he's just like, oh, oh, your rocks, is it? Oh, 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 I just have to do a little bit, boop. And they all fall over like dominoes, which has been done to death before also. Uh, and he's like, oh, no, your big pile of rocks has fallen over. I'm like, oh, oh, my God. They so the good thing that they did that I skipped over a second ago was when she gets knocked from Paris to the UK, they do this really stylized version of the globe that looks like a like a cartographer's map of the world with the name France and then the name United Kingdom. And I thought that was cute. And then they do it again when she knocks Thor from the UK to uh, the US. Like it looks like probably uh, New Mexico more than likely. Uh, and then they just kind of keep doing it over and over and it's like, okay, all right, this bit was funny and it's feeling a little less, I don't know. It's feeling a little bit less funny as time goes on. Um, there's a, there's a weird shot that everyone's been talking about of a woman on a beach with like a big floppy sun hat as they're fighting in the sky. And everyone's like, so is that supposed to be a recognizable person? I'm just going to say that it's count countess Val, whatever. Val, uh, for no reason other than I, I literally don't know who else in the MCU would even be there to start with. And it was such a weirdly like, let's hang on this for a second shot that I, I don't know. Um, so there was that. 
at one point, Thor places Mjolnir on Carol's stomach, which is ba- which two things. One, he did that to Loki in Thor, and it was a smart move. It actually completely pinned him down. Since he can't lift Mjolnir, he can't move Mjolnir either, which meant he was stuck in place. Notably, Loki, when this happened in the movies, was like visibly not comfortable about Mjolnir on him, and he was like, ah. <sighs> Meanwhile, Carol is just kind of like... <sighs> Like, she couldn't move it, but she was not in any sort of pain at all. So, that's a cool little little power differential thing that's being noticed there. But then he picks it up after he has the whole crowd call her a party pooper. Party pooper, party pooper. And he takes the hammer and it's like, why? Why would you not immediately start restart the fight at that point? Um, Maria Hill is the acting director of S.H.I.E.L.D. because Nick Fury got bowled over when Korg, like, charged through the crowd. Uh, this fucking episode. Um, Jane tries to call, uh, or rather, yeah, Thor calls Jane. I don't know where he got the cell phone, but he calls Jane, and she steps away from Maria Hill and, and the folks on the helicarrier to have a really painful secret conversation with him that ends with her ending the call with, love you, uh, I mean, uh, oops. And I'm like, oh, oh, God. Sorry, I just my life flashed before my eyes for a second there. Uh the entire last like 3 minutes of this episode, actually more than that, maybe 5 minutes of this episode revolves around a my mom's coming and I have to clean up the earth before she finds out. Oh no. F- fucking it's uh, it's like the worst sitcom tropes. All of the worst sitcom tropes when it comes to like sitcom parties all wrapped together in what feels like a never-ending half hour of of 3d animation um also i'm curious how long a bifrost actually takes because in most most of the movies it seems like it's like like a couple seconds and here it's like they literally clean up the entire planet of all of the evidence of a party in the time that Frigga takes to get from her sister's realm, wherever that is, uh, to Earth. Jane calls out to Heimdall so that she can tell Frigga that Thor is misbehaving and partying. Uh, um, some interesting things that I noticed during this that weren't the most painful ever. Odin's vault contains a complete infinity gauntlet. I don't remember if it was a complete, so it's a false gauntlet in the actual movies. And I forget if the infinity stones are in them or not. I don't remember if they're in there or not. If they are, then this is just a whatever. If they're not though, then that's like, huh, that's interesting. Um, I like the Top Gun uh, acknowledgement. They're like, oh, you have a cat. What's its name? Goose. Ah, oh, Goose, and you're a maverick. Top Gun. It's like, okay, that's kind of a cute little thing to have there. Um, Howard the Duck was pretty was pretty fun. Uh, apparently, uh, he and Darcy elope at one point during this Vegas vacation situation uh, because he, like, when they show up in Vegas again, he's like, look who decided to come crawling back. Mrs. The Duck. And he's like, okay, that's that's fun. I like that. Uh, Frigga knows who Captain Marvel is. That's pretty cool. I mean, I would assume that, 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 that she would, but also Captain Marvel has only been active for, like, 20-ish years at this point. So, like, that's pretty cool. Like, Frigga, who's been alive for thousands of years, is aware of who you are as a, like, galactic savior. That's pretty neat. Okay, here we go. My list of the only good things I have to say about this episode. And I really tried. Um, The episode features, at least at the start, a handful of Dutch angles, which at least makes it feel consistent with the movie Thor. Ding! Uh, when Thor arrives, he says, your dull lives are about to come to an end, which I think is a good line, but it is a predictable double meaning. As soon as they landed, I was like, oh, they're going to party, aren't they? Yep. There it is. Um, I mentioned the label map, the, the labeled map. Uh, I do like the fact that Captain Marvel and, Th- and Thor get a fight because we don't get a lot of superhero versus superhero fights anymore in the MCU. 
uh, and the two of them are pretty well matched. I think if it really came down to it, Captain Marvel would probably win in the long run, at least against this Thor. Uh, current Thor in the MCU is a little bit tougher. He might actually be able to pull it off. It's kind of close. It, they're, they're certainly going to be comparable. And it is nice that we got that like we got Hulk versus uh, Wanda in the Zombies episode. So I thought that was nice. Um, Crossbones is working with S.H.I.E.L.D. as he was as part of the strike team. And he gets bummed when they don't nuke Thor in Siberia. And he's like, oh, we never get to fire the nukes. Um, which I think is a, a cute little thing, especially since this is definitely happening in happening in lieu of the Avengers, or at least, I mean, it might, it, this might take place after the Avengers. All we know is that this is somewhere in the midst of everything else. Um, because we don't see any of the other Avengers at all. Um, Clancy Brown is back. I mentioned that. And then the only thing that people seem to be like, whoa, wait, what about is the ending of the episode? Uh, at the very end, the Watcher's like, uh, love blooms and everything is good. And sometimes good things can come from silly weirdness and bad things. And uh, wait, what? And they turn and you see Ultron and his army. And Ultron is in, is this massive hulking form. And as it gets closer, you see that his, in his armor, he's got five infinity stones. And the helmet goes, and inside is the vision with the mind stone. So Ultron completed his vision and has all six infinity stones. That's a big deal. That's a hell of a cliffhanger. And the Watcher didn't see it coming either, which makes me wonder if this is an Ultron that is crossing between dimensions. I'm kind of wondering if in the last three episodes they're planning to tie it all together with some kind of timeline crossing threat. I have not seen uh, this week's episode yet, uh, episode eight. So I don't know if they're following up on this, but as things that need cliffhangers go that certainly felt like something that could use one um i'm wondering if like the last episode is going to be like what if you know what if the timelines fought each other or something like some weird thing i, I don't know but um also i'm kind of wondering how ultron even exists here so tony began well tony revived the ultron project from so how, I think it was an originally a, a, an idea of Howard's that he that he left behind and presumably Howard and Hanks. Uh, and he only revived it and brought it to fruition because of, I mean, among other things, his PTSD as a result of the Chitauri invasion and going into space and nearly dying. Uh, but if Loki was a frost giant, the odds of him actually like enacting the Chitauri invasion for Thanos is pretty low. Nebula's here and not attacking anything. So that also seems like a thing where Thanos would have, I don't know, done stuff already it, or like Thanos couldn't have done stuff already or she wouldn't just be kind of hanging out. Um, and yeah, so I have to imagine that this Ultron is in fact crossing timelines, but I also don't know how that would happen since I don't know that the, so the time stone, as far as we can tell, the time stone is able to send people back in time and can create new branches, but he looks like he just walked out of a different timeline, which I'm not sure the time stone can do, but granted all six infinity stones could hypothetically do anything. So Maybe that's well within the purview of the Infinity Stones altogether. I don't know. I'm curious if they're going to follow up on this. I'm curious if they're going to follow up on any of these. And I do not like this episode, as I said before. Uh, most of it was a chore, very painful. The characters we saw are mostly super out of character and annoying and a pain in the ass. And... Some of the, the ones that aren't are painful by virtue of not having a straight man to bounce off of. Uh, having so Thor has Thor and the Guardians of the Galaxy, the 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 outer space world of excuse me of the MCU has started to become a lot sillier. But there's groundedness to that. Serious moments, serious characters. This episode has none of that. There's Maria Hill who does not directly interact with anybody. Nick Fury tries, and then he gets put into a fucking coma. So it just feels like Saturday morning, not even Saturday morning cartoons. Like this is, it's just a mess. It's a big, silly mess. And it's kind of 
awful to sit through. Um, it's not technically bad. And by that, uh, by that, I don't mean like, oh, it's not technically that bad. What I mean is like, there's nothing technical about it that I can think of that's particularly wrong or bad. So I can at least give it points for that. Uh, the voice acting seemed pretty solid, generally speaking, uh, like across the board. I, yeah, but for the most part, this episode sucked and I didn't like it. And the end, the end, the literal last 30 seconds of the episode are the only thing really worth watching here. I pray to God we do not have to suffer through more of, um, uh, only child Thor again. Like I really don't want any more of that. Um, so I'm going to give this episode a three. It was really bad. It's easily the worst episode of the series thus far is in my opinion. Um, just, just no, just very no. Um, I'm amazed that I've, that I've been able to give an episode a 10 and now an episode of three of the same show. That's shocking to me. Um, but here we are. I would love to hear what you guys think of the episode. Feel free to drop them into the comments below. I'm going to probably go and watch, uh, the next episode shortly and then we'll see how that goes. And then the finale, uh, the season finale is coming up next week, number nine. Uh, and then we're going to be off uh, from from this series until uh, Eternals comes out. So, oh boy, I hope they, they get, uh, kick it up a notch for the last couple episodes. Because this was a bit of a bummer after the last couple. So, yeah. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you guys next time. Bye.